You're listening to an Anderson Entertainment production. This episode, we're putting the drive in hard drive in Fab Facts. It's all getting a bit chilly in the randomizer. And David Quilter takes us back to Space Precinct. That's all coming up in pod 211 of the terribly exciting Jerry Addison Podcast. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. Hello, Richard James. Oh, hello. 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 How are you? It's a, uh, fine. I can... It, you, so, this gives some insight to the posturons today. Yeah. When we record, obviously, we record separately because, yeah. you know, we're many miles apart, we even are. though it feels we're oh so close together. Mm. And uh, in your recording booth, and it is a booth, I would say, it's very professional. Oh, yes. Very much so. You're surrounded by very lovely angled foam and duvets <laughs> that's right yeah and yeah. The, the duvets are making me feel a bit hot and bothered <laughs> i feel like it's too hot for you to be li- basically covered in duvets yeah well you're right yes it's true imagine how i feel you know i really yeah, am i'm suffering for my art that's what i'm doing yeah <laughs> so is this I your art the listeners well, should suffer too <laughs> okay, okay, Postron. So if you're sat uh, in in a very warm environment, make sure you've got a blanket around you yes. to really feel the stresses and strains yeah. that Richard and I go through. Exactly. Well, not me, because I'm not surrounded by blankets. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, this is the Jerry Anderson <laughs> podcast where we don't normally talk about the technicalities of recording, but it felt appropriate today. I'm Jamie Anderson. Who are you in the duvets? Oh, well, I'm, uh, I'm a very warm and snuggly Richard James. Fantastic. Uh, and over there, not at all wrapped in duvets. In fact... No. He's, he's blown up a 1990s yeah. Thunderbirds paddling pool yes, filled he with has. water and ice. He's yeah. bathing there. And I think <laughs> that drink he's sipping, is that a Paloma? Is that what they call it? Is it a Paloma? I, think I don't is. know what a Paloma is. It's grapefruit and tequila, oh, I believe. That, it, yeah, that's one of his favourites. So it could be. Yeah. Well, see. very summary over there yeah, in the paddling it. pool is Chris, the randomizer Dale. Yeah. Uh, he's called that... Not because he spends his time in paddling pools, but because he presents the randomizer, which comes at the end of this podcast, where he randomly selects a random episode of a random Jerry Anson show and says extremely thoughtful, incisive, hilarious, witty uh, and uh, erudite things mm. about that episode. Yes. Yes, he's, he's, he's nodding and gave me a tip of his yeah. hat there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> but between now and then... There are yes. many other things that we do on the Jerry Anderson podcast. If you're a regular pods drawn, you'll know that. But if you aren't, or you want reminding, here's Richard James to remind you of those things right now. Well, a very warm and snuggly Richard James. Let me just wipe the sweat from my brow <laughs> and uh, let you know, well, a little later on, we've got the second part of my interview with David Quilter, who you may know oh, of Strons, Yep, as uh, Captain. Oh, no, no, he was a sergeant, wasn't he? Sergeant. I think he was... Lu- was lieutenant. No, he was a no, sergeant. You're, sergeant. You're right, Sergeant Fredo. Sergeant Fredo. Sergeant Sorry, I'm sorry. Sergeant yeah. Fredo, I think was his name. Really? I think. I think. Yeah. Uh, anyway, yes, he'll be talking to us yeah, a little later on about his uh, experiences working at Pinewood, but also his first ever sci-fi experience working in Blake Seven. Oh, oh yes, he goes way back. crossed over. Yeah. So uh, yeah, all that to look forward to a little later on. We've got, of course, some news of the Jerry Anderson universe because there's always something new happening. Uh, we've got uh, Fab Facts coming up in a little moment, and our Podstrons have been getting in touch by emailing us at podcast at jerryanderson dot com, hashtagging us on Twitter, hashtag Jerry Anderson Podcast, and. Oh, yes, posting on our Facebook group. I had to think what I hadn't <laughs> mentioned there. Yeah, so if you are on Facebook, Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> just ha- just type in uh, um, you know, Jerry Anderson Podcast uh, Official Listeners Group and you'll find us and you can join in the fun and I'll be reading out some of those posts a little later on. And also, Jamie, uh, oh, also. last but by, by no means least, we'll be paying tribute to another figure uh, who's loomed large, really, throughout uh, Jerry Anderson fandom uh, over the last, gosh, decades and that's ralph titterton who we sadly lost just as we were recording in fact the last podcast but wanted to respect kathy just for a couple of days to give her uh, the option uh, to keep it to herself and, and and let her friends and family 
know the news before we blurted Absolutely. it out on the podcast. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> so apologies for our delayed uh, celebration of, of all things Ralph, but I think yeah. uh, now now is the time. Now, I yes. have known Ralph since I was probably about four or five years old. Mm. That's my earliest recollection of, mm. uh, of Ralph. Uh, you know, always there throughout Anderson fandom. One of the founder members of Fanderson way back in the day, I believe. Yeah. Uh, a, a huge part of making sure that Barry Gray's music was preserved and made accessible to people. Uh, he was working behind the scenes on the concert for many months alongside me and Rachel Wibley uh, to bring that together. And it, it's just such a tragedy that the, he didn't get to see the concert. He was, he was not yes. well enough to go to the concert. That's right. And we didn't manage to get the video to him in time either. So I'm, I'm very, very sad about that. But I did send him bits and pieces and he absolutely loved it. Uh, so yes, all, all things across the years... Ralph has been a very passionate supporter. He was a great supporter of mum and dad. Uh, and uh, one of the th- first things um, that uh, mum said was, you know, well, what a loss, because he was yeah. always, always there, kind of a permanent fixture. Yeah, indeed. Uh, so on that note, I've just uh, picked up some messages that I'll be uh, spring- sprinkling throughout the podcast, uh, much as we did with Matt Zimmerman. I mean, I, I was saying to you a moment ago, Jamie, before we started recording, this is becoming a regular event, isn't it? But uh, that is life, isn't it? It is. It is life. Um, but let's let's celebrate those who are no longer with us rather than yeah. uh, be too too sad about it. I, you know, Ralph was a regular listener to the podcast. Yeah. Uh, I would often <laughs> pop me a text afterwards and say something was particularly brilliant. Uh, so <laughs> rarely, I would so, think. Yeah, rarely, but he, he would do sometimes. Uh, yeah. So he was very enthusiastic about the pod and I'm sure he'd love to know that he was being celebrated here, uh, you know, rather than us uh, being all sort of too down oh, about absolutely. things. Absolutely. Yeah, too right. So on that note, for example, just a few quick messages before we plough on. This one's from Phil Singleton, who says, Rest in peace, Ralph. Big thanks for your dedication to fandom and the soundtracks you curated for us all to enjoy. Uh, Clive Stewart Erdley says, Sad day for fandom today. A lovely man who will be much missed. Penquilla says, Sad news. I understand we owe him a lot for preserving and making available much of Barry Gray's work. And uh, finally for now, Joseph Bedell says, uh, Very sad to hear this. Ralph was a very nice chap. Uh, and that's a great epitaph, isn't it? Indeed he was, yes. Yeah, very nice guy. Uh, and, and always keen to help in any way possible. So, Indeed. Yes, we we tip our hats to you and salute you at the same time, Ralph. All right, Absolutely. okay. Yeah, we could do that. Is yeah, that possible? Sure. Yeah, that's what we're doing. I would think so, yeah. Uh, so yes, many more tributes coming up throughout the podcast. Brilliant. Uh, and thanks to all of you who've uh, have shared your thoughts. We will share as many as possible today. Mm. Uh, but there's loads more across our YouTube channel, and uh, Facebook page and Twitter. I mean, they are everywhere. Um, yeah, so there you right. go. there's a little sign of the impact that Ralph had over the decades. Yeah. Now, Richard, we have to keep things uh, as normal, which well, of course unfortunately we do. for you means that oh. I am now about to. <laughs> don't don't preempt this. I'm <laughs> sorry, going to sorry. reach over to my book of fab facts. Yes. For a section we like to call fab facts. Yes. <clears throat> go on then. Now, time for this week's Fab Facts. Richard's favourite segment, and mine of course, and many Podstrons too, it's Fab Facts, where I have a book of Fab Facts. There it is being flicked. There uh, it is. In a moment, I'm going to flick it more formally, and at a random point during said flicking, Richard will cry fab at the or top just, of his lungs. Or just cry, yeah. Or just cry, either of which will be a sign for me to stop <laughs> flicking, where we will hopefully happen upon a Fab Fact by pure happenstance... Uh, and random shouting and flicking. So, Richard, are you ready? <laughs> well, I think so, yeah. <laughs> Good. Then here we go with the flicking. <laughs> Fab! Oh, you, you I, left I, that know, late. I know, I know, <sighs> okay. I know. I saw the panic in your eyes. I, with the, uh, my eyes were widening as I could feel the, <laughs> the pages running out. It was it was very trapped oh, in the sky, it, I wasn't think. Wasn't it? Absolutely, yeah. yes. So, because you left it so late, uh, oh, right, in fact... Yeah. This sort of fits with something that I've seen rather recently. Uh, have you seen on YouTube a video from online YouTube personality Tom Scott, Richard James? No. Brilliant. OK, well, that makes this uh, easy. Anyway, uh, Tom Scott recently posted a video uh, where he wanted to test whether the theory of driving backwards, like in an SPV, was something that would actually work. Ah, uh, yes. So he worked with a company in France to build... Mm a go-kart that could be driven backwards just like an SPV. Now, he said some things 
mm. that were nice about Captain Scarlet and some things yeah. that were less nice about yeah, Captain so Scarlet. Yeah. Uh, but it was a really interesting video, quite fun. But if, for those of you who are not familiar with Captain Scarlet, uh, in that show there was a lovely, beautifully designed SPV or Spectrum Pursuit vehicle where the, uh, the drivers sat in a rear-facing seat and drove via a TV monitor. Now, the point of this, according to Dad, was to increase safety. Something which is much needed in the world of Cat and Scarlet because there were quite a lot of accidents and death and disaster there. (laughs) So thank goodness for driving backwards in an SPV. If you were to get into an accident uh, in a rear-facing seat, so the theory goes, you will be thrown back into the seat rather than being thrown out of it. Okay. Unless you crashed when you were reversing, I suppose. But let's not get into that. Uh, surprise, surprise, the Century 21 film team were not that far off in this theory, at least according to the tests in the YouTube video. But did you know that the SPV was an inspiration for an entirely different piece of technology? Oh, no, go on. No? No. Uh, if I asked you, Richard, yeah. what a lacy, rugged hard drive was, would you know what I mean? I have no idea because I'm 53. Brilliant. Well, for oh, those no, of you on. who... Yes, yes, yes. Oh, that on. little orange okay. uh, orange kind of rugged looking that, things that yes. you plug into your computer. Now, oh, ah. now you've got it. Now you've got it. Yes, <laughs> oh, yes. yes, yes. Right. So it's a very, it's a very popular brand of drive for uh, an external drive for your computer uh, that features an orange bumper all the way around that may look familiar to Captain Scarlet fans. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it turns out that this similarity is no coincidence. The designer of the lacy, rugged hard drive is a man called Neil Poulton. Neil's originally from Scotland and now works from his studio in Paris, or Paris for the non-French speakers. Oh, I see. Uh, And he's cited the SPV as an influence for the hard drive's signature look, um, which he gave in an interview with Business Wire. And if you look at it, you can very clearly see the the shape and the curve and all, yeah. all the proportions of it are basically yeah. the front bumper uh, from the SPV. Now it makes perfect sense because Derek Meddings purposely de- it makes perfect sense because Derek Meddings purposefully designed the bumper on the SPV to look a bit like a shock absorber which is, is exactly the function of the bumper on the hard drive. So uh, have a look around your uh, desk mm-hmm. and you maybe mm-hmm. you've got one and have a look at it yes. and compare it with your dinky SPV which I'm sure you've also got to hand and you'll see the similarity there are there any other uh, items around your house or office though Podstrons that you can find that have an Anderson influence wow. do have a look and let us know perhaps you have a, a big rat apple slicer in your kitchen <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, maybe, or a yes. Fireball XL5 pepper grinder. Oh, ooh. Uh, I like that. <laughs> yeah, that sounds or, good. Or, or something else, anything else. Uh, we'd love <laughs> to know. Uh, even if there isn't a direct uh, correlation, we'd love to see yeah. your suggestions for what might be anyway. Do yes. send your submissions in to podcast at jerryanderson.com. And we hope that one day Neil Poulton will dr- join us as a podcast guest. I think we have emailed him, but have not yet ooh. heard back. Who knows? Maybe he'll hear this fab fact and and you know be rushing down our door yeah. no Richard no, oh, sorry, because sorry, we're, sorry. We're, we're being very nice anyway yes. dad had loads of those lacy hard drives in fact I think ones mm. in my in my storage cupboard I've got two of his old lacy hard drives I don't even know if he knew the connection he what? must no. have done but I don't yes. remember him mentioning Gosh. it so yeah how funny I think the nearest I've ever got to that, Jamie, is I'm sure, pretty sure, that someone posted at some point on social media a picture of a potato that looked like Officer Orin from Space Precinct. <laughs> I'm sure that's happened. Now, that's not quite a product. It's not quite what you're after, but that's the it's nearest I can get. Very close, but we're now dangerously getting back towards the time that we asked for vegetables that look like um, oh, yes. Anderson vehicles. And I, <laughs> I, I don't think we, we need to go back there. Oh, so, we've come so far, haven't we? Let- <laughs> <laughs> Full circle. <laughs> Let's just stick with products. They look like they may have been designed uh, after an Anderson vehicle. Uh, yes. We'd love to hear from you. Do drop us a note. But anyway, that's uh, that's that, I think, unless you've got anything else to add. No, I don't. No, I'm just wondering good. what I'm going to say at the end of this particular item. You, yeah, I'm not really sure either. I mean, mm. bear in mind, it was a lacy, rugged hard drive. <gasps> Okay. I think there's something there. Okay. So, uh, that brings Pretty. us very closely to the end of this week's 
Rugged, rugged fact. fact! They're completely oh. spontaneous. Completely yes, off no, the top of my no head. No planning at all no, there. No prompting. <laughs> nothing at all. <laughs> uh, now, you're listening to the Jerry Anderson podcast. Of course you are. What is this? Pod 211, I think. So if oh, you haven't yes. heard all the rest, you can find them somewhere on the thought, internet. Uh, <laughs> I yeah. thought you were going to say something rude, Ben. If you hadn't heard them, you can... F- <laughs> Find them. Yes, you can find them probably on Spotify or uh, iTunes or Apple Podcasts as they are now or on YouTube. You've got a lot to catch up up with if you haven't heard them. But in the meantime, here's another uh, little tribute to Ralph Titterton, who we lost recently. This is uh, Chris J. Beaumont, who says, I met Ralph at a Leicester convention some years ago now after hearing him speak. A really nice gentleman. We kept in touch by email uh, and you said he hadn't been well, but I hope it wasn't too painful for you, Ralph. Thank you for all your hard work and I hope that it goes to a safe place and can continue to be appreciated. So perhaps, Jamie, we should speak a little bit about the work he did for the, uh, the, the Barry Gray archive and I guess what might happen to that now. Uh, so Barry and Ralph were friends, I believe, um, oh. back in the early 80s before uh, Barry passed away. Uh, and then Ralph basically took to charge of the archives. So all of Barry's scores and his cue sheets and his notes and other paperwork, mm. tapes, no, just a huge amount of stuff. And then worked to make sure that that material was available for things like the soundtracks, which lots of you have uh, yeah. been buying recently. Yeah. Uh, yeah. By, by making those things more accessible. Um, he's also made things av- available to researchers. He's worked with arrangers and orchestrators to, to bring the scores to life and to make them available for things like our, our concert and many others. Yeah. Um, just always a strong proponent of anything Anderson and he also had a vast collection of uh, of material you know everything from promo brochures from uh, ATV and ITC right through to the more modern Carlton Granada and ITV ones right wow. you know a huge huge volume of stuff mm-hmm. so yes I mean you know obviously no one will be applying any pressure to to Kathy who's Ralph's uh, a very very long time partner uh, to do anything with them but you know there's mm. lots of there's lots of support available uh, yeah. to make sure that those are preserved, and they will be. You know, Kathy, yes. Kathy is is hugely involved in the archive too. She may well continue on her own, uh, yeah. but yeah. Uh, yeah, the support's out there. The hard work's been done. M- much more that can be done, and I'm sure mm-hmm. that will continue. So again, thank you, Ralph, for your service. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, over to the emails now, then. People have been uh, dropping them in at podcast at jerryanderson.com. For example, this is from Dom Riley, who says, Greetings, chaps. Hopefully this finds you all well. First off, I'm deeply saddened to hear about Matt Zimmerman. Uh, I had the honour of meeting him twice once at Comic-Con in Newcastle-upon-Tyne. Uh, his stage presence was immense. The man had charisma in spades. He had the wit to match as well. I remember when he was coming off the panel, he noticed I had a sword in my rucksack uh, made out of foam, and he took the hilt and proceeded to playfully hit me with it. Then again, at Anderson uh, 2017 where he recognised me and asked me how the missus was. Uh, The word legend gets thrown around a lot but Matt was indeed a legend who will be sorely missed by his family, friends and fans alike and that's from Dom Riley. On a similar note, I mean, you know, they're leaving us uh, and we love to pay tribute to them, of course. That's, the, that's all we can do. Pen Quiller says, lovely to hear all the tributes to Matt Zimmerman on Pod 209. He was a great entertainer. Always happy to talk with the fans at events. I was lucky to meet Matt several times at conventions and enjoyed his wit and charm. I also interviewed him once for the fanzine of the Tracy Island Writers Forum. He was very chuffed ah. that we called the newsletter Ned Cook's Newsflash. Uh, One story, now I don't know if you know this, Jamie, he told us during the interview, was that though his birthday is listed in official sources as 26th of December 1934, he was actually born on Christmas Day. He was born in a convent hospital, and when his mother queried the date on the birth certificate, the nuns told her, no, that's the Lord's Day, no one gets born on that day. So like the Queen, (laughs) he had a real birthday and an official one. The world has lost some of its sparkle with his passing. Rest in peace, Matt, and that's from Penn Quiller. That's a lovely story, Penn. Lovely Uh, story, thanks Thanks for sharing Uh, that. Absolutely. Hello, Jamie, Richard and Chris, says Matty Keskivari. I just wanted to make sure of something. Ah, since I've already bought and received the Stingray Deluxe Edition Blu-ray from the Jerry Anderson store, does it mean that the newly announced extra discs will be sent separately later? Would I need to present yes. some form of proof or purchase for no. that? Right, there you go. <laughs> Good. Excellent. Moving yes. straight if on. You, if you buy or have bought the Deluxe version from us, then as soon as the extra disc, which features the Superspace Theatre and some audios and various other goodies and some amazing behind-the-scenes uh, home movie footage that's mm-hmm. never been seen before from uh, ah. from the original shooting of Stingray, which is wow. super, super cool, then that will be sent automatically to you with nothing for you to do and uh, will appear in your letterbox in due there course. You go. 
Great. And a final email. This is from David Lee Summers. In pod 209, Richard remarked on his surprise in discovering a book from the 1930s that discussed Martian canals and how they might indicate, indicate life on Mars. As it turns out, I've been a Martian, or rather, I've seen a Martian canal map from 1962 commissioned by NASA for the Mariner mission. By 1962, few, if any, scientists ser- seriously believed the canals were artificial structures built by intelligent life. However, a few scientists did speculate that the linear features could be natural geological features, like the linear features which are ultimately found, or were ultimately found, on Saturn's moon Enceladus. As it turns out, the Mariner mission demonstrated once and for all that the canals were merely an optical illusion. (laughs) Anyway, he says the Jerry Anderson podcast continues to be a bright spot in a sometimes scary world, and that's best wishes from David Lee Summers at the Kitt Peak National Observatory. Thank you very much oh. for that, David. I know, isn't that cool? Brilliant. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. I like, I, like. I love the the breadth of, uh, of you know different careers and ages yeah. and all sorts and locations from our lovely podsterons. It's always yes. brilliant to hear. So thank yes. you. Yes, and I always love the breadth of. The, you know, for example, we've just had an email uh, going into quite some detail about Martian canals and uh, their appearance yep. in literature over the twentieth century, and then we're discussing potatoes that look like Officer Orin from Space Precinct. Uh, and it's, the same podcast. <laughs> it's the juxtaposition <laughs> of those amazing things that keep us going. <laughs> there you go. Do send your emails in uh, podcast at jerryanderson.com and I will be sure to uh, read them out next time. Fan Bloomintastic, Richard James. Yes. Yeah. Uh, would you like a little bit of Jerry Anderson news? Because I've got some Jerry Anderson news for you. Ooh, just a little bit, like a filling in a sandwich. Uh, a club sandwich. Oh, bring it on. Yeah, here we go with some (laughs) Jerry Anderson news, club style. Jerry Anderson, club style, newsy, news, news, news. Richard <laughs> wasn't even paying style. attention there. No, I wasn't. So I ended I'm up sorry. saying it. Oh, he, was, he was texting uh, on his phone. Yeah, that's tut, a first. Tut. I missed it. Wow, wow. Yeah, yeah. That, let's hope that doesn't happen again because if it happens yes. in 212, then, you know, <laughs> I'm out. there'll be a verbal warning coming. Oh, quite right, yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Sorry. Oh dear. Anyway, so uh, obviously the the very sad news of uh, uh, of Ralph Tutton's passing is something which we're going to sprinkle throughout this uh, in terms of uh, you know recollections and memories and tributes from all over the place. Uh, and our thoughts and condolences go to Ralph's uh, partner Kathy uh, and obviously his friends and family and colleagues. It's a it's a very sad and unexpected loss. Yeah. However, there are always good things, and Ralph was one of those people who was always very excited about everything we had coming up. So, let's get on to some new stuff that is just being announced. Yeah, okay, you may hear some excited dogs throughout this, so apologies for any little yaps. <laughs> They're just very excited about the news. Are they? Uh, so, you, they are. You may well have seen the announcement of Thunderbirds versus The Hood Ooh. on Friday. Did you see that? Yeah, that, now that sounds brilliant, yes. So, this is part of our new string of audios about Thunder about Thunderbirds they're not about it's Thunderbirds audio yeah, dramas yeah, just is so yeah. these are not these are not uh, from the John Thaden novels there's no narration these are full cast audio dramas and they're adapted from TV21 comic stories so uh, they are fantastic I've been listening to them well, I cut the trailer so I, uh, I've i been listening to them all the way through and they uh, they really take things off up a notch from the Thaden novels we're very very excited about these and Thunderbirds versus The Hood is a pairing of two stories from TV21, The Vanishing Ray mm-hmm. and Brains is Dead. Oh, what no. a great title that one is. <laughs> yeah, yeah so lovely. let's have a quick listen to the trailer for Thunderbirds versus The Hood. Anderson Entertainment presents Thunderbirds versus The Hood. Two new full cast audio adventures from the pages of TV Century 21. The Vanishing Ray. I believe that one is arriving now, my lady. Do have it, Parker. Your intellectual powers are no use against my skills at interrogation. I have a feeling that we have not seen the last of that hairless gentleman. Curse Lady Penelope. She will pay for this. Brains is dead. Gun are being attacked. I... Uh, uh... Brains, brains? Your mind belongs to me. Gordon, are you okay? For pity's sake, Gordon, answer me! 
first raiders over the top, Jeff. They're closing in on Thunderbird 3 Silo. The destruction of international rescue is about to begin. Oh, well, that's wetted the appetite, isn't it? Hasn't Whoa. it just? Yes. Really, really lovely. Uh, I'm very excited about it. Now, uh, if you want a little bit a little bit of a teaser, uh, mm. Thunderbirds, The Vanishing Ray, has been adapted by Ben Page, original writer, uncredited. So who knows who wrote it originally? Well, uh, well. We, we're going to keep trying to track that down. But uh, mm. in The Vanishing Ray, when Lady Penelope gets a strange new invention in the post, MI5 and International Rescue's evil nemesis, The Hood, soon comes calling. And now it's up to her ladyship uh, and her stalwart Parker to solve the mystery of The Vanishing Ray. Oh, I like that. That's exciting. Yes, that's good. And Brains is dead. International Rescue is rocked by the death of one of their own when Brains is the victim of a seemingly motiveless murder in New York. (gasps) But before the team have a chance to come to terms with the loss, they find themselves facing an all-out attack against Tracy Island. What? Their oldest enemy is about to make his final and most devastating move against them. And among his new allies is a very familiar face. Oh. (gasps) Who's that? It's not you, is it? Well, that's the, that's the dot dot dot. You have to listen to find out, Whoa. won't you? But it's very exciting. I, I, I'm, yeah. I think you can mm. tell from my tone of voice, possibly, yeah. that I'm very excited about these. Yes. The team has done a fantastic job, uh, and like I said, it's it's really elevating these stories up a notch from taking those audio books, which obviously, you know, they are books from the 60s so they're written yeah. at a certain pace in mind they're very long yeah. these episodes come out at about 40 45 minutes so they're very much uh-huh. like the tv uh, episodes in terms of the length and they are packed with action so nice you're gonna love them uh, grab them from the jerry anderson store downloads available from bigfinish.com uh, and they'll be delivered kind of august ish so it's not too mm-hmm. long to wait because we're yeah. pretty much in july already <gasps> yeah yeah pretty Ooh. much now yep. From the old to the new, even though it's new old, this is new new. Oh, yes. If you get what I'm saying. Yes, uh, sort of. I think this might be a podcast exclusive because I don't oh, think we'll announce this at this point in the day. If you're listening yeah. near uh, the early time of release. Yeah. New Captain Scarlet, ah. Operation Sabre oh. is on its way. Now, Operation Sabre is a new 102-page graphic novel of the uh, of New Captain Scarlet, written by our very own Chris Thompson, illustrated by Connor Flanagan, and uh, it also includes Skyfire, which is a brand new bonus New Angels adventure, written by our very own Andrew Clements. Nice. Uh, well, well. It's it is a lovely thing, fantastic graphic novel, uh, and if you want a little hint of what's to come, here's the synopsis. Desperate for a swift resolution to the war against the Mistrons, the world government has turned to the shadowy organisation Sabre to take the lead in fighting the alien menace. With Captain Scarlet forcibly detained for scientific experimentation, Colonel White must choose between his best agent and the future of Spectrum. (laughs) That's pretty exciting. Spectrum is red. Uh, (laughs) Now, there's a very special launch day signing at Forbidden Planet in Belfast oh, yeah. on the no, 9th no. of July with this book being released on Captain Scarlet Day itself, obviously, the 10th yeah. of July. Great. So uh, if you are in or around Belfast and would like to uh, meet writer Chris, illustrator Connor, uh, writer AC, and unfortunately also me, we oh, will be at no. Forbidden Planet Belfast, I know, on the 9th of July, signing a limited number of copies and uh, having a chat and saying hello. So we'd love to see you there. Someone's got to make the tea, haven't they? Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm sweeping the floor as well. <laughs> uh, then, I'm, then I'm flying back to uh, Manchester for uh, a screening of Life Uncharted on the 10th of July. Right. Yes, it's a busy weekend, that one. Yeah, Oof. great. Now, let's uh, just move on a little tiny bit. If you are enjoying the summer heat but need some Anderson goodness for your wardrobe to enjoy the summer heat in, then this coming Wednesday, we're launching a T-shirt time warp. Oh, right, yeah, sounds good. Do you know know what that is? Well, I'm guessing it's uh, it's like um, some T-shirts from um, back in the day that have been discontinued, but you've got some left over. Well... There's two not left over. <laughs> no, you, we're going to produce ask. them especially for people. Oh well, I didn't. There's know. two elements to the time warp. One is that a few designs that have been discontinued will be reawakened, but for one week only. Mm-hmm. The other thing we're doing is taking all T-shirts back in time to 2022 prices. 
So since twenty, sorry, twenty twenty two to twenty twenty <laughs> prices. Oh, Let, no, that doesn't sound sense. as good as an I, advert. Mm. Yes, no, no. A t- so, so a, just t- for a time travel machine that brings you back to the same year in which you lived really isn't a time travel machine, is it? No. Okay. So no. let me just clarify. We're taking right. the t-shirts back to twenty twenty prices oh. because in the last two years, obviously with COVID and everything else, materials costs and transport costs have all gone up. So we've had to raise the prices. But again, for just a few days, we're taking the prices back to what they were in 2020 which is around 18.99 19.99 so we break down nice. under that 20 quid barrier so if you want to grab some now is the time to do it from this wednesday with our t-shirt time warp i can't even say it no it's good though it's a good one um, yeah uh, and finally i think i mentioned it last week but if you are in the usa canada or mexico and you would like to grab some goodies from our usa store you can go to jerryanderson.store and order there where stuff will be dispatched from our columbus ohio warehouse and reach you more quickly, efficiently, and affordably than if you buy from the international store. So uh, that's at jerryanderson.store, but only for US, Canada, and Mexico customers, please. Otherwise, you'll be sending stuff overseas for no reason. Why would so you don't do, do that? that? No. Just don't. Silly thing to do. No. Exactly. Anyway, whew, that's probably it. There's so much exciting stuff coming up um, oh, but, yes. uh, Thunderbirds uh, audios and the new Captain Scarlet graphic novel I'm very excited about and I think yeah. you're going to love them so uh, that's it anything else to add Richard or can we wrap this bit of news up let's wrap it up wrapping up now that's the end of this week's Jerry Anderson news that was the news time travelling news <laughs> yes time travelling unless I forget <laughs> the the idea of actually travelling in time <laughs> Now, don't forget, you can subscribe to us on whichever platform you're listening to us on. And wouldn't it be nice if you left us a lovely review or a rating or a revating? A five star would be great because that just tips us over the edge in terms of the algorithms and makes us more visible to other listeners who might, you never know, might enjoy the podcast too. Um, we can't now, guarantee uh, it, but they might. <laughs> we can't. No, we ne- no guarantees. Uh, over on our Facebook group, uh, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash podstrons, David Hollis posted a picture of his standby for action flyer from Birmingham saying, thank you so much for the great night of music and Richard James and Chris Dale for the work you do behind the scenes with Jamie Anderson. Also for the signed programme I pushed for on the night. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. Hashtag cookie yo-yos and all the podstrons on the Facebook group. Robbie says, I wonder if anybody else caught the name of Buzz Lightyear's ship in the new film coincidence and he posted a picture it was a very entertaining movie by the way says robbie xl01 <laughs> i haven't That's seen the film yet but now yeah. i'm looking out for it yeah yeah uh, tom hodden says apparently i'm the kind of cookie yo-yo who's interested enough in movie reviews to know that it's only two thumbs up or down on the rare occasions that both siskel and ebert agreed but for genre snobbery, it's a thumbs down from me. So, yes, uh, a few comments on our uh, YouTube channel as well about this. Uh, that uh, There were the two critics, in fact, and they both had to give a thumb up or a thumb down. Uh, so if they both went thumbs down, that was considered two thumbs down. Yeah. Right? All clear? Maths. Makes sense. Yeah. It's all maths. James Johnson <laughs> says, and when it's genre snobbery for something you apparently have never heard of before, let alone actually seen... Whoa. Mm. Yes, quite right too. And Rob Doyle says, hello all. I've just noticed that Big Finish have added some of their Anderson audiobooks to Audible. Only seven yes. ninety nine if you're a subscriber. Yes, absolutely. There's two Thunderbirds titles on there and a few more besides. So uh, do pop along to Audible if you're an Audible listener. And you yeah. can get most of our Anderson stuff probably on about a six month delay from release okay uh, uh, with your credits there and if you do listen please do leave some ratings there oh yes please, and the reviews yes. because they really really help they yeah. you, you wouldn't believe how much they help so if you want yeah. more of the same uh, or more of new stuff mm. ratings actually help us quite a lot yeah uh, ian allen says another t-shirt stand by for action to go to my collection nice only ordered that uh, from the fab anderson store yesterday and i received it this morning now that's what i call fast top Hurrah. marks of store and a lot of other stores could learn a thing or two from the anderson store many thanks to the team ah uh, we do our best but tim and louise do a fantastic job at keeping everyone happy uh, yeah. even when things can be quite tricky especially now we've sort of yeah. international and there's yeah. publishing and there's apparel and all sorts of stuff and amazing they do a remarkable job so well done tim and louise tom hodden asked the podstrons how do you listen to the podcast answer by saying i've been blank 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 with richard and jamie <laughs> matty keskavari says i've been eating with richard and jamie 
Rebecca Andrews says, I've been on the bus with Richard and Jamie. Robert, Robert oh. Monk said, I've been building a train set with Richard and Jamie. Ah. Oh. Meanwhile, last couple, Paul G says, I've been dusting my Daleks with Richard and Jamie. And Steve Beresford, I've been in the bath with not only Richard and Jamie, but Mummy A and Sophie Aldred. <laughs> Gosh, that sounds a bit packed and awkward. <laughs> Doesn't it? Mind the taps, that's Oof. all I can say. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Mm. Uh, yeah. Not sure mm-hmm. I feel about that. Uh, also says, did you know that cookie yo-yos are an actual thing in Australia? There you go. <laughs> 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 Little cookies. Uh, I nice. didn't, but I'm, now I'm quite yeah. hungry. Yeah, there you go. Uh, all for now, but uh, there'll be plenty more next week, no doubt. But in the meantime, do join in our Facebook group, the friendliest group on the internet, and join in all the fun. Yes, and it is fun and friendless. Mm. I mean, oh, yeah. fun, yeah. friendliness and frolics, I would say. Oh, very is that good. fair? Nice, nice alliteration. It's fair. Brilliant. Another one. I tried. Another F. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> uh, before we get stuck in a world of alliteration, Richard James, <laughs> I believe this is all to do with you, this next bit, this second part ah. of a feature. So yes. what's happening? Why is it happening? Who are we talking to? Who are you talking well, to? Well, I'm talking to David Quilter, who's... Uh, Jerry Anderson fans will know as Sergeant Thorold Fredo from uh, Space Precinct. <laughs> uh, last week we spoke about his early days in the business and how he got started and his experiences in theatre and the early days of uh, television. Well, not the early days of television, that would date him a lot, uh, but his early career in television. Uh, for this week we uh, ploughed on into the future a little bit to talk about his experiences working on Blake 7 uh, and also his many, many roles for which I've included a little montage of on Space Precinct. Have a listen to this. I determined that after a certain spell of doing theatre, I would I would do telly. Mm. So I set about writing letters, and one of the letters I wrote was to David Rose, who produced a police series called Softly Softly, yeah. which was the sort of afterrunner of the original Z cars. Most people probably watching this Never heard of them. But, um, <laughs> I'm but sure they, they, were, have. They, were, they were the sort of cop shows of the time. Mm. Anyway, I eventually got a, a regular part on Softly Softly and did um, 28 episodes of that. So that kind of opened a few doors and also it got me to meet many directors Mm. who um, subsequently employed me. Um, Yeah. At at still quite a young age then, uh, softly, softly, mid to late 60s, 67. Yeah, Yeah. great. Uh, Yeah, I mean, it's it's extraordinary that you, you just said there that, you know, you've decided you would be, you know, you you'd rather work in television and so you made that happen i mean that's completely the the other way around these days in that as an actor we have no choice where the work comes from well no quite i mean you never really had a choice but you had you you, you, but you what you could do was contact people yes i mean directors and producers are so protected now from yeah yeah um these upstart actors that uh and, and i'm not you know i'm not surprised because everybody Mm. Everybody wants to be an actor. It's mm. a, yeah, and in some places, everybody is an actor. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, now you're... No, it, was, it was so different, and the way it was the way television was done was so different as well. You went into a rehearsal room mm-hmm. for ten days, two weeks, three mm. weeks, and then you went into the studio for two or three days and shot multi-camera. You'd do the whole scene right the way through. You were a company. Uh-huh. Almost, almost theatrical in a way. Almost a theatrical. So you would company. go in. Everybody would go in every mm. day and be there. And if if you weren't in a scene, you'd sit around the edge of the rehearsal room, watching or trying to chat in you know inconspicuously. Mm. Um, and it was, it was just much nicer, mm. really. Mm. And the, the BBC built a rehearsal room block in North Acton, and there were I think there were about eighteen rehearsal rooms. So you'd go up to the canteen at lunchtime, and you'd be sitting at a table with Omar Sharif or Morecambe and Wise or Dick Emery or, you know, it, yeah. it could be anybody. 
it was just magical. You know, it was it was like a it was a club and it was it's fabulous. Yeah. But now you 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 learn your lines at home, you turn up for your day, you meet the person you're working with, you do a camera run through and then off you go again. Mm. Yeah. So, your 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 first brush with with sci-fi was uh, was in an episode of Blake 7. Is that right? Which uh, which which is now on BritBox. So I actually watched it uh, a few months ago. Really? Yes. Uh, uh, the Tracer. Well, that was that, that was another. That was from a director from Softly Softly. Right. David Proudfoot. Yeah. David Sullivan Proudfoot, as he was. Yeah. And that was filmed under the same sort of uh, conditions you've just described. You, you rehearsed, yeah, yeah, yeah. rehearse for the week, and then and then record as live, as it were, almost. Yeah. Mm. So, Space Precinct then was was a very different kettle of fish. It was my first experience, really, of of uh, any kind of big telly work, and I don't think I appreciated at the time quite how different it was from the usual television setup that you've just described. Well, it was different. Yes, I mean, it was American, basically, mm-hmm. but. I, I don't think most of us were aware of the fact that it was American at the time. And I remember the first day of filming with Colin Buxy, yes, um, directing, who was also somebody I'd worked with before, and we were doing English voices. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if it was that day or within a few days, somebody came around and said, um, it's got to be American. Mm. And... Um, so we all started doing American yes. voices. Yes. Uh, of course, when these marks, you know, it was very much, it, it was going to have to be revoiced anyway. And, um, oh God, I was on the phone to my agent so quickly saying, I think this might be a huge mistake. Um, they want us to be American <laughs> and they're going to get Americans in to do the voices. Yeah. And I said, ask them if they'll audition. Yeah. Us, or at least me. Yeah. And so we auditioned, and thank God I was able to do my voice. Yeah, and, but it was it was um, it was very it was strange. I mean, it was, and I, I remember one actor. I won't name him, but um, he came in and said, "Well, I didn't I didn't get it. I didn't I didn't get it, and I am an American." <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so right. uh, so yeah. Um, <laughs> And he subsequently left the series, of course. I yes. mean, we can we can we can name him. We've spoken. This is Tom Watt. I mean, it's that's who, yeah, who, played, right. who played Beazle in the first first few episodes. You say that uh, you know for a little while there, it was feeling like this might be a terrible mistake, but it was sort of a happy accident in a in a way that you ended up with the role. How did that come about? I was having a tough time. I think at the very beginning of ninety four, the end of ninety three, ninety four, and I just. I think increased my mortgage, <laughs> so I was. So it was an extremely tough time, mm. and I I went to a friend's birthday party, and um, there was a casting director there who I knew called Corin Rodriguez, and she said, "How are you doing, David?" I said, uh, "Well, actually, Corin, I'm in big trouble. I mean, I, I need work. So what are you going to do about it?" And she said, "Well." Uh, I, I can't do much. She said, oh, I, I could probably get you a, a day and a mask at Pinewood. <laughs> so I said, fine, I'll be there. Uh, thinking no more of it. Yeah. Anyway, the next day, my agent rings and says, um, you've just been offered space. It was called Space Police then. Yeah. You've just been offered Space Police. And I said, oh, a day and a mask at Pinewood, great. And I said, no, it's 40 weeks over a year. Huh? It was, I mean, it was like winning the lottery. It was yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. Um, I couldn't believe it. It was suddenly a sort of cloud fell away. And yeah. I was in this sort of <laughs> heavenly state, <laughs> uh, not, not knowing what, what it entailed. But um, I couldn't believe it. Anyway, the, the next day I was out at Pinewood having my full face cast. So uh, just to be clear, so there, there was no audition as such. You hadn't seen a, a line of, of the script. No, no, wow. Well, somebody had dropped out. Um, somebody had dropped out because they got claustrophobia apparently in, in, the, right. in the mask. Yeah, and um, so they were in a bit of a panic. Mm. And 
Corin suggested me and Colin Baxi knew mm. me. Mm. Yeah. So it, it was on those two, it's okay, that yeah. it went through Jerry. Wow. Um, but I didn't meet Jerry until the first day of filming, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, I was sort of led to believe that it was not necessarily a done deal until he did okay it. Mm-hmm. But anyway, it, it, it worked out okay. What do you remember of the uh, the whole uh, mask fitting and the the life cast and all that were you were you comfortable with that had you done anything similar to that before in your career not with masks i mean no I, no i hadn't actually mm. no, I, I, no. Mm. um well it wasn't so much a mask as it was a whole head mm. Mm. it was um and and we'd have our chins stuck on first thing in the morning and then the head would go on for the take yeah yeah um and then it was, you know, the, the, these heads were amazing constructions because they were electronic. You know, everything was, they, they actually moved and the eyes, were, you were looking through, I don't know, the nostrils or somewhere under the yeah, right. lower down. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, and was, even there was a bit of gauze over your eyes so that you couldn't see very well anyway. Mm-hmm. But um, the, the mouth moved a bit. It wasn't your mouth. And uh, um, yeah. And, and 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 basically, we were worked by somebody standing at the edge of the set. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, it's all quite bizarre, really. Um, <laughs> but but then, at the same time, it was another acting job. You know, you were there to play a part and react and act and listen. And so, I suppose there was, to a certain extent, more physicality about it mm. in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, to me it was a job and and a very welcome one, and I, and I really enjoyed it. I really yeah, enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah, and possibly a job that might have gone on beyond those initial forty weeks in a year. I mean, there was talk of first. Is the series. second series still on the cards? <laughs> there's, there's still time, David. There's still time. I think I'm a bit past it now, but <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, for for years we joked about the second series. Yeah, and um, I mean, at, at the time, I think we thought there would be. Yeah, but then looking at the way it was done and the rush in which it was got on, it was probably a non-starter because it was it was actually ill prepared. There wasn't a strong enough what they call bible. Yeah, to, right. To, as a groundwork, um, yeah. and it was a pity. It was a pity because it was a tremendous opportunity, and it, I think it could have been great. And there were some, there were some really good things in it. I was pretty scared. But I really concentrated hard, just like you said. And I got an A. We're proud of you, sweetheart. But we'd be proud of you no matter what score you got. I'll get it. Now, let's open your present. Ta-da! Emotionary, too. Oh, no. I mean, thanks. Emotionary, too. Whenever you're ready. Hi. Hi. Hey, guys. Come on in. I brought something for you. Bueno. There you go. Wow. Fizzy chip cookie dough. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. As much as you can eat, there's more in Mom's freezer. I think you'll need a spoon. (sighs) This takes the cake, bro. Vinny Artek running for city council. Time on a tradition. All right. Okay, everyone. Vinny Artek. I gotta tell you, I'm overwhelmed. I mean, all of you helping me the way you do. And then, just a few minutes ago, find out. In spite of the attacks on my character, that I'm getting in the polls! Is this over the top or what? This is for the cameras. Mr. 
Spartak, you've been accused of connections with organized crime. What's your response? Excuse me? I'm referring to reported connections to the Creon underworld. There is no Creon underworld. <laughs> you heard it here first. The politicians and the corrupt police better get the message. Corrupt? Us? I'm gonna win this election because I'm just a citizen like you. And I'm gonna be you in the assembly kicking lazy bureaucrats butt! Yeah! Yeah! Look diseased. Oh, no, sir. No. These are the best in Demeter City. These look diseased to you. Hey, I wouldn't let a lizard rat eat garbage like that. And they smell just like a filthy, stinking Z right. Where is everybody? They'll be here, Flag. Who's she? No idea. But if she knows the location, she must be all right. Oh, she's more than all right. Uh, and what were your impressions then of the cast? It was a mix, wasn't it, of uh, the American leads and some older British actors like Jerome Willis and so on, and then the young whippersnappers like me. What was what were your first impressions? Well, I, I think we all got on pretty well right from the start, I think. I mean, I, I got the impression that most of you had already met, so I felt a bit like a new boy, hmm. um, but that was fine. Hmm. Um, but... Uh, no, I and mean, I, I liked Ted tremendously. I thought he was great. And I liked um, Rob. In fact, I'm still in touch with Rob. Uh, Rob Youngblood? Uh, he's a real estate agent in, in Florida. Yes. Um, does pretty well. But, um, yeah, I, I, I can't remember why we got in touch. But um, yeah. I think it was – I can't remember. I can't remember. Anyway, um, <laughs> no, I, I, I liked everybody. I thought, um, you know, Mary and um, – yeah. Simone and um, yeah, and of course, the redoubtable Lou Hirsch, um, <laughs> uh, who we're all also in touch with on Facebook. And yeah, yeah, that's true. yeah. So, um, it, it's, we had some really good times. Yeah, funny enough, Lou isn't that happy to uh, to join us for a, for an interview. Strangely, <laughs> <laughs> although that, that'd be quite an eye opener, I think. <laughs> well, he was he was one of the original voices and mm. came in to replace Tom, mm -hmm. um, and was and was really good and funny in it, and yeah. um, but did not enjoy the mm. the, the, the mask wearing and yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah. It wasn't. I mean, probably a lot of us. It wouldn't have been our first choice of job, sure, because you want to be able to show yourself, yeah, to a certain extent, and. You know, you can always say no. <laughs> yeah, true enough. And uh, no, I thought, no, it, was, it was a good job, and it was it was um, it was fun, and um, and everybody was great. And, and let's face it, we, we used to have parties together. We used to socialise together. So it was that was a good sign of you know a good company. Mm. And uh, what of now then, David? Bring us up to date. What what do you do with your time these days? I do. Uh, Sort of what you do. Uh huh. I write. Ah, right. But, yes. But but unlike you, <laughs> I don't do it for money. <laughs> <laughs> I barely do it for money, to be fair. <laughs> well, well, I do it for nothing. Yeah, yeah. I do it as occupational therapy. Uh -huh. um, but no, I've just, I've just finished my first novel. Right. Well, yes, and it sounds right. impressive. Yes, it does. Yes, it, it's in the genre of. Salacious rubbish. Uh, and, it'll it'll sell. And, uh, <laughs> but it's um anyway. I, I'm I'm on the tinkering with it, and yeah, and then I'm going to send it to an agent or two. Very good. Well, how lovely to talk to you, David. Lovely to see you. you and uh, next time I'm in Suffolk, I'll swing by and uh, have a cream tea with you. Do by all means, please do. <laughs> I mean that. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us, and uh, lovely okay. to talk to you. Okay, thanks, David. All right, bye.
Oh, well, there lovely. we are. Yeah, thank you so what much, nice David, man. for joining us. Yeah, now he's and uh, David nowhere Porter to too. Uh, thank you very much. He's uh, <laughs> nowhere to be found on on social media, really. But uh, over on our Facebook group, I think Alex Pass actually posted some links to his Titanic videos. David's Titanic videos from YouTube, where he's uh, yeah. recounting the stories uh, that were written down by his grandfather. Um, mm. of his experience on the Titanic so that's definitely worth a look uh, and also yeah maybe there's a book coming in the future from David Quilter so we'll look out oh, for that too yes yeah. and once we know we will definitely post some links sure. or titles or yeah. things yeah that's great so there we are thank you David nice to talk amazing. to amazing now next week can I give you a little preview of what's to come yes please we're going to be entering the danger zone with, uh, Ooh, not, sure why, not sure why I did it like that. Ooh, no. uh, let me try again. We're going to <coughs> yep. be entering the danger zone. That's better. With, um, that's, that's the right way to do it. With yeah, uh, yeah. Andrew Harmon. Oh, um, yes. Yes. One of those sounded sinister. One sounded exciting. I'm going to stick with the exciting mm. one. Okay. Uh, so Danger Zone is our new Thunderbirds card game, which is out uh, very early August, I believe. Andrew is the designer behind it, and uh, he's going to walk me as a games novice through what the game is how it's played uh, how he's designed oh. it and uh, it's it's really fascinating actually and I, I, I feel well I'm very excited to play the game myself now so uh, if you're wondering more about it then next week is the uh, is the pod for you mm, great sounds good it does it yeah, will it does. yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah what else have you got? Well, now I'm going to head back over to uh, various social media outlets to uh, just read out a few more tributes from uh, the lovely Ralph Titterton, whom we lost just last week. Uh, Ralph, for example, says, uh, oh, beg your pardon, this is James Fielding, who says, uh, very sad news today about Ralph Titterton, who passed away on Wednesday. If it wasn't for Ralph, the music master reels to Thunderbirds and the whole of Barry Gray's estate would have been lost forever. He was very kind and helped me out over the years. Needless to say that he was very much respected among the Anderson community and achieved so much with the Barry Gray archive with numerous soundtrack releases over the years. Scott Sadler posted, just learned of the terrible news of the passing of Ralph Titterton, who sadly passed on Wednesday. I'm sure all throughout the group offer their condolences and words to his family and friends. Ralph was a passionate fan uh, for the work of Barry Gray and the shows uh, that he brought to life uh, with his wonderful music. And once again, uh, they've been restored and will be enjoyed forever. R.I.P. from Scott Sadler. Peter Lawson says, so very sorry to hear the sad news. Sleep well, Ralph. So quite an outpouring, really. I mean, it's lovely yep. to hear, and I'm sure it's a tremendous uh, uh, solace to Kathy as well to hear these lovely messages. Yes, I think she's been, you know, very grateful. She she actually dropped me a note and said she'd been reading them and it made her feel even more proud of everything that yeah. Ralph achieved. So that's right. that's really nice. And so don't underestimate the comfort that your kind words and thoughts can bring no. Poster on. So feel Indeed. free to, to share those. We'd love that. Yeah, lovely. Uh, now, have you seen what the randomizer's is up to? What is he doing? I've been looking well, out the corner of my eye. He's yeah. drinking his yeah. own paddling pool water. Yes, is, isn't he? Oh, hang on. What? He's, it's not water. What? It's cider. I don't know what, what he's up to. What? Yeah, Chris, you see that stack whole... of empty cans behind. Oh, God. Um, wow. I mean, he's a typical Brit on holiday, isn't he? He really is, even though he's just here hanging around while we there. do the podcast. Chris. Uh, so, well, let's hope he's not too tipsy. I mean, I wouldn't drink my own bath water, even if it was cider, but up to you, Chris, oh. whatever. Uh, <laughs> so hopefully he's feeling uh, cool and uh, happy and slightly lubricated perhaps uh now he's had his cider ready for his randomizer where hopefully he won't drunkenly press the uh, randomizer button and uh, uh -oh. give us a random episode yeah let's see what happens yeah. over to you strongbow guzzling randomizer other ciders are available Well, I think I found the trouble. What was wrong? The faulty power transistor. I put in the spare unit and it's functioning perfectly. Well, that's very good of you, Mr. Kent. It'll sure be good to have the randomizer working again. Uh, but perhaps we ought to do a test run, you know, just to be safe. Okay. If you think it's necessary. The countdown's well underway. I guess where does that leave us? Well, that leaves us to carry on as usual. Yes, as I said, it's just a test. Uh, no point actually watching whatever comes out. Ah. So today's episode would have been New Captain Scarlet, Chiller. Uh, we'd still better report it on our next transmission. Uh, what, you mean I should actually go ahead and watch it? Yeah, it's three days overdue already. Well, okay, if you really think the Podsterons won't mind. They won't. But I feel kind of tired. 
Yeah, me too. Although that kind of is my default state. Just a technical hitch. Nothing serious. Technical hitch? Not quite. We've got less than seven hours of oxygen left. Oh, well, that's a nuisance. I wish you'd said something sooner. Well, maybe Jamie and Richard will have to find another host for the randomizer. They can ship up another with the supply rocket. Ah, all's well that ends well then. Right, well, while we suffocate in the freezing vacuum of space, this is Chilla. So, we welcome back to the randomizer, new Captain Scarlet. I am recording this on the hottest day of the year so far here in the UK. Some people might cool down with uh, some ice cream or uh, go swimming or something. I'm going to cool down with Chilla. Listen, get out of here, okay? Again, not planned. That's just how it goes on the randomizer. The story. And we have a very interesting opening here. I don't see I got a choice. Jeremy Hitchin is, um, well, I'll, I'll, me I'll mention it now because it's not long before we find out for real. To your species. A Spectrum sky base technician. You meant what you said, right? Being offered a lot of diamonds to do something for some, uh, well, a rather smartly dressed chappy. For us, you'll be a hero among your kind. That's uh, voiced by Robbie Stevens, and uh, Jeremy Hitchin is the, uh, the technician guy. And this is a really nice idea, I think, because we're about to find out this guy in the suit is a Mistron, and his uh, bodyguard is also a Mistron. Firstly, I really like the idea that there are Mistron agents at work on Earth. Very similar. You know, between stories. Oh, that's that's the guy's name, isn't it? Story. Uh, the, t the technician's name is Story, I think. Yeah, that's odd. Yes, he's just been given a bomb. You're on duty in 12 hours. By this Mistron chap. Yeah, I like the idea that there are more Mistrons on Earth. There's there's possibly a network of, of Mistron agents already there. It's not just we kill someone when we need them. Maybe we could, uh, you know, do a more of a long-term plan to bring down the Earth. Here's Scarlet come to, uh, well, put a stop to everything. So, yeah, I, I like that aspect of it. I like the impression we get here that, you know, there are more Mistrons than Captain Black at work on Earth. By the way, that is a terrible shot of Story hiding under the table. Story! They're lying! Help them and you're murdering everyone on this planet! Yeah, he, look, he suddenly looks like Quasimodo when he's hiding under the table. That's a really bad shot. But um, also, I like the fact that, oh, Scarlet took out the Mistron henchman, and he unfortunately got shot himself. That Spectrum armor does nothing, <laughs> apparently. Um, yeah, I like that it's... We've got a very similar villain to Captain Black in this episode, this Mistron guy that Story's been talking to. Kill him. You Mistrons fixed that. He looks like Black. Your clock is ticking. He's just saying the same kind of things that Black would say. I, um... Permanently. Maybe, um, Nigel Plaskett just wasn't available to do voices in this episode, and they got this other guy, um, they got Robbie to, to play this other guy, but I really like it. Again, you've got... It's not just a Black being the only one on Earth. There are other Mistron agents of, you know, similar, you know, sort of, almost admin capabilities. This guy seems like a... A sort of administrator, a facilitator almost of things, and he's just stopped this truck driven by, well, it's the Jerry Anderson CGI figure, and here's another very interesting touch to these CGI Mistrons. The truck driver's relieved he didn't run over that guy. Unfortunately, he probably wishes he had. Hey, buddy, you trying to get yourself killed? Right idea. Wrong person. <sighs> oh, and this is, I think... Yeah, he, he gets the truck driver by the throat, gets really close to his face, and sort of Mistron energies transfer to the driver. And I've always assumed that that is a similar process to what happened to the general guy in the second half of um, uh, Instrument of Destruction, that he hasn't actually been Mistronized. They're just some level of Mistron energy or intelligence has been transferred to the driver, just enough for him to drive his truck. Uh, what's this truck? Kagutsky Petrol Chemicals. Oh, it's a big old truck. Uh, I have a feeling we've seen this truck before, possibly in um, in uh, Reign of Terror, maybe. But the truck driver is diverting, heading straight for the diner where the uh, Spectrum Traitor was being paid off, and now where Scarlet, who has recovered from his gunshot wound, has found himself tied up, and uh, he's in the path of the truck. Even he is not going to be able to get out there. Oh. Well, that is quite, quite the death for Scarlet there. 
I like the way that they establish it's a really big explosion. Um, also, again, very rare for Scarlet to actually die in this show. And I love this shot of the Mr. On Agent watching it from a distance. And then he turns to the camera and smiles. It's almost like... Uh, almost like a, a design for a Christmas card. You know, Merry Christmas from the Mistrons. Here's a terrible explosion. Yeah, very rare for Scarlet to uh, to die. Oh, oh, here we go. Is yes, it? for those of you playing New Captain Scarlet Bingo or the New Captain Scarlet drinking game, it's there again. I've mentioned it so many times on Lieutenant Green's board. The words engineering emergency. Look for him. Their altitude is dropping. Oh, everything's going wrong and nobody's paying any attention to it. So, Blue has been sent out to find Scarlet. He's found Scarlet's car. I found Scarlet's cheetah, Colonel. Mm. It's off-road about 80 miles west of Phoenix. Is there any sign of him? Uh, just some tracks headed north. According to the map, there's nothing but sand that way and an abandoned diner. Only today there's something else in that direction. Mm. Smoke. A lot of it. Oh, Blue's got a sat-nav on his bike. Captain. Nobody else seems to be bothered by the uh, fire in the distance. But, again, you get the impression there's not many people living around there. That diner was old and abandoned. Blue has taken him up to Skybase, where a couple of uh, rather sinister-looking technicians are wheeling him through to sickbay now. Well, Blue's just doing that striding swagger thing that he does. Ah, oh, well, it'll be all right. He's indestructible after all, isn't he? Oh, and of course, Destiny's there. Bad, isn't it? Well, put it this way, um, we didn't have enough buckets to bring him up. Poor Destiny. Because she loves Scarlet so much. And looking at the animations on the characters' faces here... You'll be okay, Adam. I kind of wish they'd... See him. Oh yeah, I, li I like the idea that he um, he's really mangled. Yeah, I kind of wish they'd had another crack at this episode later on. He's dead. When the uh, when the CGI got a bit more sophisticated, there's so much emotion in this story. Injuries were devastating, and the the animation just doesn't quite carry it off. It's only put down to his body's remarkable abilities. It looks better than the very early episodes, but he's died before. It's just the, the weight of this story. There's so much emotional impact here, and... By now, we've always seen some sign. The visuals are kind of not quite there. But the actors are, are doing a really good job with this. I like the, particularly the body language here. You know, Destiny's obviously devastated, and Dr. Gold is just sort of resigned, leaning against the table with Destiny yelling at him. He, he did everything he could, obviously. Quite sure, Mason. There's no question. Maybe... Just give it another hour. What's an hour to eternity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no reason they can't just uh, keep him on ice, as it were, in the morgue. He's always going to... Well, if he wakes up, he wakes up, and if he doesn't, he doesn't. Speaking of, Spectrum Jet has just returned to Skybase. Returning Skybase personnel. Routine security DNA tests will be conducted at security point four. And among them is the traitorous technician. And of course, I think this is the episode that establishes there's a DNA check for returning personnel, which was always the reason why the Mistrons couldn't get into Skybase as easily as they could Cloudbase in the original series, because they've got to go through the uh, the DNA check. And of course, that's why they picked this traitor guy to uh, to carry out their, uh, their, their mission, take the bomb to Skybase. I was on assignment. And Scarlet's all right. Bay, what happened? Did um, I take a bullet? I don't remember. Again. Mm. Hey, Doc. And here it comes. Doc. Whoa. Gold walks straight through him. He can't see him. He can't hear him. It's almost like he's not there. At another hour, my friend. I'm sorry. It makes no difference. You've earned your rest more than most, Scarlet. Oh, no. Rest in peace. Yeah, I love Gold making that statement while Scarlet's there watching him. I'm dead? Oh, no. And this episode, um, it has been compared to uh, the uh, Star Trek The Next Generation episode, The Next Phase, where uh, there's a transporter accident and Geordie and Ro are, are knocked out of phase with the rest of the universe. They can see each other. But they just can't be seen by anyone else, and they pass through doors and walls as if they weren't there. What am I? Which is a very good episode of that show. No, 
something's going on here. And I, I think there's more going on here than just, that's a really cool idea, let's borrow it for New Captain Scarlet, because this story goes in a different way than that one. I mean, some of the beats are similar. Scarlet finding out what he is, and um, also there's uh, a, a baddie plotting to destroy either Scar Skybase or the Enterprise. But I, I think it touches on core elements of this series and just the idea of Scarlet generally. What is he? What is his future long term? Does he have a soul? Does he? Is there an afterlife for him? Is there anything for him? He's gone. Can he die forever? After everything they said about him, he was just a man. And I love that there are no answers for anything at the end of this episode. It's brilliant. Whatever the Mysterons had done to him. But I, I never thought I would lose him. <laughs> Although, again, I love that Destiny is always just so, oh, he was my Scarlet, even after the Mistrons. Oh, oh, she completely. It, it's, it's very convenient for her to just forget that she was with Black for a very long time. I promise, whatever has happened, I'm never going to leave you. I'll always protect you. God help me spending eternity looking after you. And this is where I say some of the animation could be better in this, but at, at moments like here where Destiny's tear falls through Scarlet's fingers and crystallizes into ice as it goes down. It looks brilliant, and the soundtrack is really nice as well. That lovely empty sound of, uh, of the ice breaking. And Scarlet's now finding that walking through walls and doors, it's uh, taking a bit out of him every time he does it. And who should walk by? It's Story, our friend Story. Which is enough to remind Scarlet of... Help them and you're murdering everyone on this planet! Everything he saw in the diner. A bomb. No, you don't. Oh, that was a nice reaction shot on his face there. But of course, there's nothing he can do to stop Story. And here's something that... Uh, it is a nitpick with this episode and with uh, the Next Generation episode where... Um, of course. I'm Scarlet is intangible, but he doesn't, he doesn't fall through the floor. It was the same with um, uh, Star Trek, Geordie and Roe. Wouldn't fall through the floor. They had to get, you know, lifts to go to various places. But they could fall through the wall. It's, you know, the science of it doesn't really bear thinking about. But again, this is hinted at. It's not the way Star Trek did it, where it was that was a technical malfunction, essentially. This is something more spiritual, metaphysical, more abstract. It's a very interesting idea. Again, I just wish the show had more time to really, really explore it. But eight minutes. I suppose I wouldn't really want to tamper with, with a show as great as this. Do. So, Story has planted his bomb way down the end of the uh, hangar bay where no one's ever going to see it, and now he's going to jump off Skybase. I love that uh, nobody really notices him go. You would think that someone would notice. Someone on Skybase would be looking out the window, and then suddenly they just see someone fall past and think, oh, maybe a story. Ah, oh, maybe we should report that. But it's a lovely image of just this lone figure running across the runway and then leaping off. I hope your shoot fails. Yeah, that'll teach you. Meanwhile, in the control room, wouldn't you know it, there's still an engineering emergency. And again, similar, um, I, I keep going back to the Star Trek episode, but I do feel it's relevant. There are similar story beats here. We have this moment of Scarlet watching Colonel White mark his file as deceased. In The Next Generation, I think Roe watched Dr. Crusher do that. You wanted to see me, Colonel? How are you, Adam? Sick to my stomach if you want the truth, sir. I'm ready to do some damage to get the mist around that killed my friend. Or you could start by doing something about the engineering emergency. It's now entering its third month. I want you to find out what? Yes, sir. No! You've got to go to the hangar deck in 20 minutes. You're all going to be dead. Leave he's it. passed through Colonel White's uh, tea. Oh, now he's touching blue. Of course, everyone he touches is getting a... Someone walking over my grave. A bit of a cold chill. Hmm. Colonel's tea has gone solid. Come in. I've asked you here because I would like you to be my latest rebound boyfriend. Uh, Scarlet's not having any of that. How are you? Oh, same as ever. Okay. I'll find them, Destiny. Yeah, and they'll blow up Skybase while you're gone. <laughs> Start paying attention, will you? Are you alright? 
I like the actually I, I take back some of what I said about the animation. I do like a lot of the the main character animation in this one. Their reactions to Scarlet suddenly touching them and flinching. Strange. It's gone. Like something freezing cold passed through me. Hmm. Maybe you ought to get some sleep. Not until you get the message. Ooh, what's going on here? Maybe the air con's on the fritz. You would assume that Scarlet sticking his freezing cold hand into Destiny and Blue's chests might, you know, do something to their blood or their heart, but they don't seem that bothered beyond the chill. And luckily, Blue has a new watch that tells the temperature. Just here. Which is also susceptible to Scarlet's touch. It's moved. Here it is. That's right. Come on, Destiny. <laughs> it's moving. Come on. Come on, dummy. Work it out. What's going on here? The hair on the back of my neck standing up like a platoon on parade. Ooh. I love there the, the implication. It's not just, but the again, the Star Trek reference. It's not a, a technical malfunction. He is, he is out of his own body. This is his spirit. This is something from, not from the world of the living, but from the world of the dead. It's gone. That is among them. So what? Obviously they can't understand it. And I, I just love that there's no explanation for what happened. Why it happened this time. Will it happen again? Will anything similar but different happen again? Who knows? I suppose Scarlet's in, not in much of a hurry to be tied up and have a, a truck driven into him again, but... Hey-ho. Destiny has convinced Blue to follow the column of coal there. No way is this some aircon problem. All the way to... The locker where Story put the bomb, but wouldn't you know it? There isn't. That's the moment where he starts to return to his body. Open the crate. Now. You're almost out of time. Open the... And he's gone. <laughs> and he's fallen out of bed as well. Yes, Dr. Gold is just... Oh, no. But I already closed his file. My God. Now he's back again. What? No sign of it. It just vanished. No cold spot. Nothing. But he left the hand mark on the on the locker, didn't he? Asks us how we got so crazy. Oh, don't do it. Don't walk away. There it is. Destiny's seen it. I knew she was good for something. Ah, there it is. Very nice Spectrum briefcase. It's a fusion bomb. Oh, and it's already fusion -ing. <laughs> Yes, I love this, uh, the facial expressions on Blue here. Did they, did they run into uh, uh, some poor nobody coming down? Out of the way! Oh, yes, it's it's a slightly nerdy, wimpy medical guy. Oh, they run into, they, they run into him and they run into his identical clone in the next corridor. What are the chances? Grab something! Hold on to the wall. He's going to throw it out the airlock. Two seconds to go. And one, two, three, four. I think they mistimed it here. Five. Oh, there we go. Maybe Mistron seconds are different than Earth seconds. But I love that shock wave of the, you know, the, the explosion going through the cloud. That would have just obliterated Skybase. You'd better come to sick bay. We all thought we'd lost you this time. And what's great is that uh, Scarlet doesn't remember any of what he did. So did I? What happened to him? Your metabolization just took longer this time, I guess. And everyone just has to sort of guess what was what was going on. We found Story's bomb. Destiny told me. Oh, I wanted to tell him. It beats me. What about Story? I love this music as well. This is very cool music. And he's got a very cool car. He's clearly invested his money quite well. He even got himself a new Hawaiian shirt. And wouldn't you know it, as they say in the uh, insurance adverts, we've still got money left over for a holiday. Where's he going to pull into now? Mr. Ron's Diner. Ah. Um, there was a lorry just went past there, but too fast to read what I think might have been an in-joke on the side of it. This seat taken. Oh. Right. So, we begin in a diner, we end with a diner. You've seen a ghost. Oh. 
and very naughty Mr. Story. Again, we end on a slightly awkward facial expression from that guy. I think maybe maybe just take that character back and um, maybe put him back in the oven. He wasn't quite done yet. But there we go, New Captain Scarlet Chiller, or one of the best episodes of the first half of the series. Because, you know, it's, it's an idea that we've seen on TV before, but it does it so well and so stylishly, and it just raises so many questions about the central concept of this show and Scarlet in general. I love it. I love it. I just... I love it. Brilliant. Good one. Oh, hey. ba, 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 ba. yeah. Uh, new cap. That's my I- I- intro to the new cap. Oh, I got it. Theme, yeah, it's good. Obviously. Yeah, yeah, it was fine. Dum 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 yes, dum dum yes, dum. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, Chris Bin's lovely al- alternative drum beat to Barry's classic. I mean, so, imagine, uh, yes. imagine, imagine being asked to come up with an alternative drum beat to Captain Scarlet. Yeah. Wow, mm, yeah. that's a bit of a day at work, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, but he did it. He did Ooh, it. It's great. Absolutely. Yep. Because the fact that we can recall it and you know hum it yeah. even badly is a good sign. So anyway, there you go. Yes. Lovely bit of New Captain Scarlet there. Um, oh, I was always almost going to let you in another bit of New Captain Scarlet news there, but I'm, <gasps> I'm going to hold back because I think I'm not allowed. But Operation Saber obviously is very exciting, and that's New Scarlet related. So nice when these serendipitously link up, even though I can't say it. Right. You know, with the news yeah. and the randomizer. Anyway, I see. I see what you're saying. Yes. Yes. Good. Good. Let's move on and wrap this thing up. Chris will be back next week with more randomizer and hopefully Great. less paddling pool drinking. Very yep. odd. <laughs> yeah, very odd. Uh, yeah, just a few final words then. Uh, in memory of Ralph Titterton, Martin Townley said, I had a dream come true helping Ralph produce many Barry Gray music CDs for the first for first uh, silver screen. Then Fanderson, God bless you, dear friend. Rest in peace. Paul Hyder says, real shame. Nice guy. And the final word, perhaps, from Mary herself. Mary Anderson says, sad to get this news yesterday. Jerry and I met Ralph in the 1970s, and he's always kind and helpful. Nothing was too much trouble where Barry Gray's music was concerned. Rest in peace, Ralph, and condolences to Kathy. Oh, thanks, Mummy A. What a nice yeah. note. She's very good and with her so words, Mummy A. She is. Yes, that's right. Yeah, Indeed. she's good at that. Well, that seems like a very good note to end this one on as we yeah. uh, raise a glass, tip our hats, salute yep. uh, the late Ralph Titterton. Yep. Um, thank you, Ralph, for all of your service, enthusiasm, kindness uh, and friendship to many. We you know, we massively appreciate it. Uh, and uh, yeah, as usual, we send our, our love to Cathy and condolences to Ralph's friends, family and colleagues. However, there are lots of exciting things happening. We can all still enjoy all of the stuff that Ralph has left behind, the stuff mm. that Dad's left behind, and many others mm-hmm. too. And yeah. that's kind of yeah. why we do the podcast. So, too right. Yeah. Let's leave this on a bright note. Uh, we will be back in pod 212 when we enter the danger zone. Oh, here we go. The yes, Thunderbirds right. danger zone. <laughs> uh, and much more besides. We hope you have a marvelous week. Stay cool. Don't drink your uh, paddling pool water like Chris Dale. No. We definitely recommend against it. No. Uh, <clears throat> but otherwise, do whatever's mm. necessary to stay yeah. cool within the bounds of the law. Right, okay, thanks for that. <laughs> Public service announcement. Hmm. <laughs> Okay. Uh, drop us a note and do all the usual stuff. Podcast at derryanson.com and do the tweets and all that things and stuff and nonsense yeah. and reviews. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, w- well, well, we'll be back next week, won't we? Probably. Yeah, almost certainly. Yeah, yeah. I bet you will. Okay. All right. See bye, you then. Po- bye, Podstrons. Bye. 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 Let's go. Spectrum is green. Uh, what is your favourite brand of cider? I'm just thinking maybe we can get sponsored. Oh, well, I'm a big fan of Copperberg. You know, they do those fruity ones. Are you a Copperberg fruity man, cider. are you? Yeah, I'm a fruity cider yeah. man, really. I, don't, well, I you find it strawberry cider. and lime. Oh, a strawberry and lime. Well, there's a kiwi yeah. one as well, a kiwi and something, I think. I don't anyway. know. I'm not, yeah, I'm not a Copperberg expert. Mm. Mm, yeah, a Copperberg expert. That's quite a tongue twister. Uh, but yes, how about, how about you? Are you a cider drinker? 
Uh, yeah, I've been more of an aspalologist myself. Right, nice. <laughs> okay, than a Copperberg, uh, whatever uh, I said before. Yes, expert. Um, yes, okay. aspal. Yeah, uh, um, you know, nice Ooh. dry. I like the dry ones that are slightly clinical tasting. You know, that they've got a kind of hospital hallways odor to them. Do you know the ones I mean? No, Is that sounding a bit weird. Not entirely. It's yes. I think you might need a bit of a lie down and a glass okay. of water. Jamie. Well, I'd rather have a pint of Aspel and a right. packet of pork scratchings. Oh. Right, right, right. There you go. There's our sponsorship brought to you by Pork Scratchings. <laughs> <laughs> Extraordinaire. Uh, yeah, nice. I do like pork scratchings. I'm, I'm going to send some emails and see what we can achieve. Go for it. All right. So, uh, nice. yeah. Perfect. And any, any, any other favourites that you've got? Let's see if we can get some, uh, <laughs> some podcasts. Oh, I love uh, Twiglets. Sponsorship. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I love Twiglet. Okay. Yeah, okay. good if I'll we didn't have some some sort of time. You, yeah, you, you email Twiglets, I'll email yeah. Aspel and uh, yeah. one of the one of the pork scratching companies, and let's see how we get on next week. <laughs> All right, look forward to it. Good. Now I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> okay, good All luck. Right. See um, you then. See you next week. Stay cool. Bye. Bye. You have been listening to the Jerry Anderson podcast. Wasn't it fun? You have been listening to an Anderson Entertainment production.